I don't usually eavesdrop on other people's conversations, and I have no idea what made me eavesdrop on this one. It was a Sunday afternoon, and I was working in the basement on the hot water heater when I heard the phone ring. I didn't know what my wife Janet was doing at the time, and since the phone in the basement was nearby, I picked up the phone. Before I could say anything, I heard my wife's voice on the second floor. Gary, you shouldn't have called it here. What if John had answered the phone? I would just tell him it's work-related. Don't be so nervous. I just wanted to let you know that everything is ready for tomorrow. We'll be at the Deska Motel in room 117. Get there promptly at 1 p.m. I'll take a bottle of chilled wine and some fresh strawberries. Don't forget to wear those black silk underwear you were talking about. Okay? Just so that no one sees us leaving work or returning together. You seem a little nervous. Do you have any doubts about this? No, no. Everything is fine. I'm just a little scared. I've never done anything like this before, and it's only natural that I'm nervous. I'm not going to change my mind. Everything will be fine, I promise. Okay, but if John ever finds out about this, I will kill myself. I have to go before he overhears anything. See you tomorrow at exactly one o'clock. I hung up like they did and sat there for about ten minutes, replaying the entire conversation in my head over and over again. Why the hell did I need to pick up this damn phone? Janet and I grew up together. We got married a year after finishing school. She was the only girl I'd ever had sex with, and I assumed I was the only one she'd ever had sex with. She was pretty and had a good figure. We had one son, Terry, who was in high school. We had few friends, and our whole life was spent together. I thought everything was fine between us but apparently I was wrong. I decided that I didn't need to drain the hot water from the water heater. There was some beer in the refrigerator in the basement. This helped relieve my pain. I decided I had three options. I could confront her directly and cause a big emotional scene. I didn't like it. Secondly, I could drop a few hints or clues or make a few comments that would lead her to believe that I was suspicious. This was a little more attractive to me than the first option, but I figured it would just put everything off until a later date when I might not know about it. The third option was to just let her get through it. I liked the last one, but with a slight modification. I decided that everything would go according to plan, but at the last minute I would give her the opportunity to back out. If she accepts it okay, if not, I'll have to attack. Besides, she could go three ways. Maybe if I'm lucky, she'll just change her mind and leave. I doubted this would happen. The second is to take advantage of the last chance that I will give her. It was a strong maybe. The last option she had was to go through with it. As much as I hate to admit it, this seemed most likely. Okay, now that I had that out of the way, I was ready to plan my attack. It looked like I could make a game out of it, and the more I thought about it, the more excited I got. After dinner, I started making serious plans. First, I had to gather information and then create a game plan. I worked for a security systems company for almost 20 years. They had been hunting me for the last year to take over the office in Huntsville, Alabama, but Janet didn't want to move. For the past 10 years, Janet has worked for an insurance company. She was doing well, but I never liked the guy she worked with, Gary Simmons. Now I know that my suspicions were well-founded. Gary was married and his wife seemed quite nice. I was upset that he wanted my wife. My move to Alabama would be good for Terry because he was committed to going to Auburn. Resident training was much more affordable than non-resident training. While we were having dinner, I decided that I would take a position in Huntsville. It didn't matter what the result was the next day, I was still going to move. I'll be able to file my residency declaration when I get there, which will give me enough time for Terry to pay his tuition. I didn't feel the need to say anything to Janet but I decided to say something to Terry after dinner. I'll report this to work the next morning and be able to hit the road as soon as I've packed my things. Once that was sorted out in my head, the rest of my plans became easier. Terry and I got along great, and when I explained that I was going to Alabama before the rest of the family, he thought it was a good idea. He agreed not to tell his mother about this. I didn't tell him anything about his mother's plans for the next day. I still didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I was sure that everything would work out. I told Janet I needed to go to Home Depot to pick up some things and left. 
The first purchase was a cell phone with a 60-minute business card. I was going to make a lot of calls, and I didn't want them to be tracked. I stopped by my favorite bar to see if I could get some help from old school friends who were less than respectable. It cost me $400 to buy two big bags of crap weed. My old school buddy Benny told me that I was taking a big risk by buying so much because I might be accused of trading. I told him that's exactly what I was hoping for. One of the guys at the bar that I didn't really know was Wolf Fraser. He was a mean son of a bitch, and everyone stayed away from him if they could. He was driving a Corvette, and I noticed him in the parking lot as I was getting out. I took a screwdriver out of the car, and in less than a minute I had Wolf's license plate. I knew where he worked, so I could call him in the morning. This was followed by a trip to the Desca Motel. I stopped in the lobby, looked at the stands of tourist attractions and restaurants, and grabbed what I needed. The clerk gave me some information about the motel, including a map and phone numbers for housekeeping and room service. Time to go home. When I arrived, Janet was watching TV. I told her I had some work to do at the office, and she said she was going to take a shower and go to bed early because she had a big day tomorrow. While Janet was in the shower, I opened her briefcase and took out her diary and phone book. I spent the next half hour writing down names and phone numbers. Then came the most tedious part. I had to enter all the phone numbers on speed dial, on the burner phone, and on my own phone. I needed to look up a few more numbers in the phone book before I was done. It looked like I had everything ready when I finally collapsed on the couch. It was a hard night. I tried in vain to sleep. I kept thinking about what Janet was going to do and wondering what I did wrong to make her want to do this. By the time I fell asleep, I had convinced myself that it was my fault and that I had failed somewhere. Morning came and I had mixed feelings. I made coffee and set the table. Janet came downstairs and looked great. You look awfully good today. Is today a special day at the office? What do you mean? I always look good. I know. While eating, we read the newspaper. This morning's conversation was less than normal, but not enough to warrant comment. I couldn't tell if she was nervous or excited. I have a lot of things to do today. I might be a little late for dinner. I said, It's okay. I'll prepare something that will last until you return. Is there anything special you want? No. Everything that is usual will be normal. It was a pathetic attempt on our part to make small talk. She knew what she would do, and I knew what she would do. I arrived at work early and made all the necessary arrangements for my transfer to Huntsville. After signing all the necessary papers and clearing the table, I walked into the divorce lawyer's office. I received the forms and information I will need to file for divorce if my last attempt doesn't work. I returned home, gathered all my clothes, and loaded them into the car removed the hard drive from the computer, and grabbed all the files and documents that I thought I might need. Most of our savings and investments were converted into valuable coins, which I also took. The banks were open by this time, so I canceled the accounts and credit cards. I understood that in many ways I was acting prematurely, but I didn't really believe in the possibility of change on her part. I went to a flower shop and ordered a dozen red roses, which were to be delivered precisely at 1.15. All this time I was looking at my watch. The timing was important. Around half past twelve, I went to the motel and found a good parking spot where I could not be seen, but the room was clearly visible. I carefully laid everything out on the front seat. Gary finally showed up. He got out of the car with a grocery bag that I assumed contained strawberries, a bottle of wine, and who knows what else. He walked straight into the room then returned and filled the ice bucket. While he was preparing the room, I started calling. The first was Pizza Hut. Hello. I would like a large pepperoni pizza delivered to room 117 of the Desca Motel. I might be taking a shower, so make sure the guy knocks loudly and long enough for me to hear him. Twenty minutes is normal. Thank you. Secondly, there was a call to Papa John's, followed by Domino's and Godfather's Pizza. Then the call went to the Golden Dragon, where I ordered egg rolls and sweet and sour pork. I assumed that half of them would call back to check the order, but that's okay, because the effect would be the same. Janet had not arrived yet, so the next call was made to the hotel's housekeeping department, where I asked for additional towels and another ice bucket. 
I estimated that it would take them about 15 minutes to deliver. Finally, my loving wife pulled into the parking lot. She went down to the end of the building so that her car wouldn't be too conspicuous. She got out of the car holding a small overnight bag. When she was about 20 feet away from the door, I dialed the number. Hello, honey. It's just me, John. Something is wrong with you. You don't usually call me at work in the middle of the day. I was thinking about you and just wanted to call and tell you that I love you. Oh, John, how sweet. I love you, too. Okay, I'll let you get back to work. See you later. Bye. Goodbye, John, and thanks for calling. Janet hung up the phone, turned and walked into the motel room. This was her last chance, and she made a decision. Tears welled in my eyes as I resumed my telephone blitz. Phone call number seven to the local TV station. Hello, is this WWC-TV? Something strange is happening at the Desca Motel. If you have a truck nearby, you can stop by and check it out. No, I don't know what it is, but the cops are on their way. Okay, thank you. I walked up to Gary's car. Luckily, he parked in a place where I wouldn't be seen when I replaced his license plate with the one on Wolfie's Corvette. On the way, I called Janet's office. She had an appointment with a certain Rob Kelly for three hours. Hello, this is Rob Kelly. I had an appointment with Janet Martin for three hours, but I have to reschedule. Could you please ask her to call me as soon as possible at 961-4452? I tried to call her, but the phone was busy. As soon as possible, please. The number was included in a telephone advertisement for a law firm specializing in divorce. I threw Gary's license plate under his car after I installed the new one. Then I went to Janet's car and drove it to the back of the motel. Returning to the car, I dialed the next number. Hello, Mrs. Simmons. Your husband asked me to call you. He has car problems and needs you to pick him up. He's at the Desca Motel, room 117. You can call him on his cell phone or just call his room. The number is 9617700, extension 117. No, I don't know why he didn't call you. Looks like he's dating a client who's quite pretty. Bye. Call 10 went to Acme Welding, where I asked Wolfie's boss to tell him that the white Honda in the Desca Motel parking lot had Wolfie's license plate. The next call was to the police, where I reported that two children were changing license plates on a car in the parking lot. I mentioned that something was wrong and just asked them to check it. I gave them Wolfie's car number. The first pizza delivery man entered the room. It looked like they had an argument, but Gary paid him, and he left. The twelfth call was to Janet's mother. Hi, Mom. It's John. I don't have much time. Janet is in a motel room having sex with a man she works with. Please call her and ask her to reconsider what she is doing. No, I can't talk about it now. You have her cell phone number, and if you can't find her there, try calling the motel. This is 961-7700, extension 178. I know I'm sorry, but I have to go. Please call now. Bye. Two more pizza delivery men entered the room, and at the same time the maid brought more towels. A heated discussion ensued again at the door, but after a few minutes everyone left. The next call was to the motel. This is Mr. Simmons from the 117th. The bathroom sink is leaking at the bottom of the faucet, and water on the floor is starting to leak onto the carpet. Can you send someone right now? Thank you. The big Harley roared into the parking lot, slowing down along the line of cars. Wolfie stopped right behind Gary's car, but before he could do anything, a police car pulled it up. The bicker and the cop were arguing heatedly when I made my next phone call. Mr. Granger, this is John Martin. My wife Janet works for you. Yes, thank you, I'm glad she's a good worker, but right now she's at the Disco Motel in room 117 with Gary Simmons, who also works for you. They're having sex there as we speak. Yes, I am sure. You have a company policy against this kind of thing, don't you? I'm sure you have their cell phone numbers. Could you call them to confirm or deny this? If you can't get through, call the motel. This is 9617700 extension 117. I no longer want my wife to work for your company, Mr. Granger, and would appreciate it if you would let her go. If this is a violation of policy, maybe Mr. Simmons should be released too. No, I'm really sorry I should have warned you. 
Thank you for your time. Bye. A bellhop from an oriental restaurant stood at the motel door. The policeman walked into the room, and Wolfie waved his arms and shouted, walking next to him. Call number 15 came to Sister Janet. Hello, Nancy. This is John. How are you doing? Hey, I have a little problem right now. Janet is in a motel room having sex with the guy she works with, and I'm driving home to get my Ruger. I'm going to go back and shoot them both, but I don't want the police or reporters to find Janet without her clothes on. Could you call Janet and tell her to get dressed before I come back? She's at the Deska Motel, room 117. If you can't reach her on her cell phone, call her room. By the way, I drove her car to the back of the motel. She may not be able to drive. You know, maybe you should just go there and pick her up. If you get there before me, you might want to take her home. No, sorry, I can't talk right now. Thanks for the help. Call me as soon as you can, okay? The traffic outside the room was hot and heavy. The maintenance guy just came in to fix the sink. The courier was trying to get the money while Wolfie and the cop were talking to Gary. The florist was standing at the door trying to deliver roses, but he wasn't having much luck. It was time for me to leave. My work here is finished. As I was leaving, I walked past the TV crew. I had two bags of grass in my car, and I didn't know what to do with them. I was going to put them in Gary's car, but I changed my mind. On the way home, I threw my cell phone and grass into the river. I stopped at the house just long enough to say goodbye to Terry. I told him that I would keep in touch with him and not give his mother any trouble for the next couple of days. I would give anything to know what happened in the motel room in the last hour. As I was leaving town, I made another call. I wasn't sure how it would work, but I tried it just in case. Hello, Gary Simmons. This is John Martin. I just wanted you to know that if you lay a finger on my wife, you will be very sorry. Do you understand? Indistinct answer. Yes, I understand. I hung up and drove onto the highway. About eight hours later, my cell phone rang. Caller ID showed it was Janet. Hello? John? Where are you? I'm on I-81 near Knoxville. Why? John, what's happening? We need to talk. We have nothing to talk about, Janet. Please, John, talk to me. Janet, I'll ask you three questions, okay? Give me straight answers to all three questions and then we can talk. Fine. What did I tell you when I called you on your cell phone today? You said, I love you. What did you do after you hung up? There was a short pause. I entered the motel room. Why did you go into the motel room? There was no answer. Janet, answer me. For what purpose did you enter the motel room? Another pause followed. John, I don't want to answer. Goodbye, Janet. I hung up and turned off the phone. I won't need it until the end of the trip. Since the company covered all the moving expenses, I got myself a pretty nice motel room and had a great dinner. I needed to get settled quickly, so I spent the next two days looking for an apartment. It was easy to get something suitable and reasonable because I'm not too picky. Next came a new telephone service and mailing address. I changed the name of my car and got a new driver's license. I registered to vote and then filled out a declaration of residence. I sent out all the papers to start the divorce. Everything went pretty smoothly, and I was soon ready to start my new job. I called Terry and gave him my new number. I asked him not to give it to his mother, but said that I would understand if she pressed him. He didn't think it would be a problem. He said she had lost her job and was very depressed. I asked if they needed anything, and he said that was fine. Terry was my only real contact with the old house. A few weeks later, he said Janet received divorce papers from a lawyer. She simply signed them and sent them back the same day. He didn't even think she had read them. She stopped wearing makeup and began selling off her clothes and jewelry. She held a yard sale every two weeks and sold everything that wasn't nailed down. I gave the lawyer power of attorney so she could sell the house whenever she wanted. I didn't want anything from the sale. She got a job at a bakery that was located next to her house. Shortly before Terry graduated from high school, Janet put the house on the market. She rated it so low that she sold it almost immediately. The sale was conditioned on the fact that she and Terry would remain in the house until Terry graduated from high school. The buyers readily agreed. Janet found an apartment within walking distance of the bakery. 
It was a small apartment on the second floor, and she left all the furniture she didn't need in the house. She gave Terry a car to take her to college. Terry helped her move and went to Auburn. By this time, she had gotten rid of almost everything that was in the old house. Terry said the apartment was like a monk's room in a monastery. While his mother never denied him anything, she deprived herself of everything. I could tell he was worried about her. Four years flew by quickly. It was a four-hour drive from my home to Auburn, and I barely saw my son. He was busy with school and his friends, and I spent too much time at work. Janet asked the property management company to send me a check after the house was sold. It was for the entire amount she left nothing. I cashed out the money and put it in the folder I had set aside for her. I bought a small house and spent most of my time making repairs and improvements. I didn't meet anyone or communicate with anyone. I just wasn't interested. I wasn't interested in getting close to anyone. Graduation day arrived and I went to watch my son receive his diploma. We took our seats for the ceremony and Janet took the seat next to me. I was glad to see her even after we broke up. She looked good, but tired. She was a little older and her lack of makeup and grooming made her seem a little sad. We smiled at each other and said hello. They had just started handing out sheepskins, so there was no time for small talk. I don't think either of us knew what to say. It was all over too quickly. The awkwardness of the moment was interrupted by the appearance of Terry. He was excited about getting his degree and talked a mile a minute. It was great to watch him enjoy his moment of glory. A few of his friends came up and introduced themselves, and then the whole group headed to Gulf Shores to celebrate. Janet and I were left alone. How did you get here? I tried to break the ice. By bus. I have a round-trip ticket, and I must be back at the station by six. Could you give me a ride? No problem. When? I took a week off, but I can't stay here. I think I'll go back tonight and spend the rest of the week painting my apartment. Sounds funny. What is my alternative? She laughed. You could stay with me for a few days. I can even take you home from there if you want. It's better than the bus. Anything is better than a bus, although I don't think going to you would be a good idea. It would be too difficult for both of us. We never spoke. Then I got angry and cut you off. I didn't give you a chance to explain anything, and I've felt bad about it for the past few years. Do you want me to tell you what happened? Tell us now, after our lives have been destroyed. Is it really too late? I think, yes. What can I tell you now to make things better? You didn't listen then. Why are you listening now? I can't answer. Even if we don't get to talk, I'll still enjoy the company for a few days. Are you sure you can't give me some time? I also took a week off. Do you have luggage? No, only what I'm wearing. I didn't intend to stay the night. We'll stop at Walmart. I'll buy you a couple of changes of clothes and we'll be all set. It's a four-hour drive and I really wish I had company. I don't see anything good in this, but I'll try. If you do anything to upset me, I promise I will leave without a second thought. Quite fair. My car's over there. We were silent for the first few miles. We got off near Birmingham, and I bought her underwear, trousers, and some tops. I also convinced her to wear sneakers, but she refused to buy makeup. I didn't insist. I just hinted. A little further down the road, we had dinner at the Cracker Barrel. She always loved to eat there. We were moving up I-65 at a good speed when it opened. To have sex. I looked at her. What kind of sex are we talking about? The answer to your last question was having sex. But I couldn't say it when you asked me about it that day. I do not know why. Either I was too embarrassed or I didn't want to hurt your feelings. I just couldn't bring myself to say it out loud. After you hung up, I realized that you already knew everything, and it was stupid of me to deny it. I tried to call you back, but you turned off your cell phone. Then I realized that my life was over. You have broken my heart. I know this, and I don't know how to fix it. I lay awake so many nights trying to figure out how to fix this, and I couldn't come up with anything. After a few years, I decided that there was nothing I could do to improve the situation. I couldn't think of anything to say. She seemed to be doing just fine on her own. If you knew what was happening, why didn't you stop it? I couldn't stop it. Only you could do it yourself. You could have said something. No. If you knew that I know, you wouldn't do this for the wrong reasons. Knowing you were caught or might get caught was not a good reason for not going through with it. 
You should have stopped it because you knew it was wrong, not because you might get caught. Do you understand the meaning? Yes, but I still wish you would say something. That's exactly what I did. Last phone call. You mean the one where you said you loved me? Absolutely right. I felt like I gave you a chance to stop before you started. I gave you a chance to make a decision. She paused. It was a test, and I failed it. I was such a fool. I won't argue. Did you love him? Gary? Heaven no. Gary loved his wife as much as I love you. We were just friends. I don't understand. Was it lust or what? Hell no. It wasn't like that at all. It was more platonic than anything else. Gary and I were just friends. We had no desire to make our relationship anything more than that. So how the hell did you two end up at a motel to have sex? It's a long story. We still have an hour before Huntsville. Gary and I worked together for almost a year. Over time, we talked about different things. One of those things was sex. During our conversation, it became clear that neither of us had ever had sex with anyone other than our spouses. We didn't complain about sex with our spouses because we were both happy with the way things were, but we were curious. The more we talked about it, the calmer we became. I don't know which of us brought it up, but we ended up talking about the possibility of sex with each other just to see what it would be like. There are no strings attached, and it will be a one-time deal. It was more like two adults playing doctor, or maybe like, I'll show you mine if you show me yours. I know it sounds ridiculous, but that's how it all unfolded. Have you ever wondered what the other side of this is? It never occurred to either of us. We got to the point where doing it was like going to the movies together. I don't know about Gary, but I didn't think you'd ever find out about this, so it won't hurt you. I was mistaken. I'm really sorry. How did Gary's wife react to this? She was going to divorce him. I went to her and explained everything to her, as I do now, to you. She didn't get a divorce, but I don't think their marriage was ever the same. Gary was fired along with me, but he protested. The case reached the arbitration court. He claimed he didn't violate company policy because we never had sex. The board of directors didn't buy it. They moved to Baltimore and I never saw them again. I was happy when we arrived at the house. Our conversation ended a long time ago and it was a little tense. Some of this was difficult for me to comprehend. I took Janet to my bedroom and took the guest room. After making sure she had everything she needed, I wished her good night. There will be more talk tomorrow. I hoped our next conversation would be more pleasant. The next morning she was already waiting for me for breakfast. The first time in a long time that I didn't have to cook for myself. So tell me about sex with Gary. Oh, you son of a bitch. You know there was no sex, and you also know why. I probably ruined your romantic evening. Actually, you know the situation. And although he brought wine and strawberries, it was not a romantic meeting. Don't imagine everything worse than it was. Well, did you guys do anything? Oh, yeah. We answered a dozen phone calls and another dozen knocks on the door. Some nasty bastard had everyone either calling us or knocking on the door. The closest we came to sex was when I took off my shoes. Did you have a bad time? It was the most miserable half hour of my life. While that biker was trying to get into the room to grab Gary, I managed to sneak away. When I saw that my car was gone, I cried. At that moment, Nancy arrived. You called my sister, and worst of all, you called my mother. She still doesn't talk to me. I'm sorry if I ruined something that was so important to you. I accept all the blame for what I did. It was disgusting. Oh no, don't. All the blame lies with me. And if you think you can jump in five years and take responsibility for everything that happened, you're crazy. It was my fault. It was my fault. It's my fault and don't ever try to take that away from me. I didn't wallow in agony all these years so you could take it from me. I feel partially responsible and have to take some of the blame. Do not do that. When I walked into that motel room, I lost all my self-respect. I can never get this back. At least you saved my virtue with your calls. I have kept this and I thank you for it every day. I only wish there was a way for you to do something ahead of time, but now I understand why you couldn't. It's sad, John. 
I love you and always have. I didn't mean to hurt you, and I'm truly sorry. I won't ask you for forgiveness, because I don't feel like I deserve it. Losing your love and trust hurt me more than anything else you could have done to me. Janet, you never lost my love. I'm glad to hear that, John, but what about our union? Sorry, but he disappeared and I don't know how to get him back. I understand, and that's fair. What will we do for lunch? What about sushi? Sounds great. Are my clothes okay? We had a good time that day. After lunch, we did some more shopping to buy Janet some clothes that wouldn't make her look like a nun. I even talked myself into buying some lip gloss, but nothing too dramatic. We dined on light soup, cheese, and crackers, and then sat down at the table with a glass of good wine. It was nice to see Janet get back to her old self. The more time we spent talking, the calmer she felt. Are we going to have sex today, John? I don't know. I have some problems. What problems? Well, I'm afraid that if we make love, I'll be thinking about you and Gary all the time. I'm a little worried, because I don't know how everything will go. This is bullshit, and you know it. Well, how do you know? I'll tell you how I know. About 30 years ago, when we first started dating, you told me that whenever you were horny, you fantasized about Pam Kramer, the cheerleader. Do you remember this? Did I really tell you that? Yes, sure. And every time we had sex for the next four or five years, all I could think about was you having sex with me and thinking about Pam Kramer. You're joking, right? No, damn it, I'm not joking. Now the shoe is on the other foot and you can't handle it. I had to come to terms with it, and I don't understand why you can't. Who are you thinking about? It's none of your business. Come on, we all fantasize. Who is your dream lover? Okay, okay. Most of the time it's you, even after we broke up. What do you mean, most of the time? Who else say the rest of the time? Do you really want to know? Won't you laugh? No, I promise. Mel Gibson. Are you kidding? Not at all. I've always dreamed of sex with Mel Gibson, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. He is a very desirable guy. Which raises another question. Who have you been dreaming about for the past five years when you were de-stressing? Mostly you. I think a lot about you. The same question for you. What about the rest of the time? Well, sometimes I think about you and Gary together. You're a sick son of a bitch. You fantasize about Gary and I having sex for pleasure. This sucks. Not really. After your date, I wondered why you wanted to have sex with Gary. I didn't have any answers, so I assumed he was a better lover than me. I was sure that in some way I had failed as a partner, and I convinced myself that you were seeking renewal. I'm used to thinking about how he will please you and bring you from one peak to another. After a while, I felt myself getting aroused, not thinking about Gary having sex with you, but about you getting incredible pleasure. I found it erotic that you were enjoying yourself and blocked out the fact that it was with another man, even in my fantasies. Okay, we're even. Now figure it out. I'm going to take a shower and after that we'll have sex. You might be thinking about Pam Kramer, but I'll be thinking about Mel Gibson. Everything is settled. Tomorrow morning we will go get my things and I will move in with you. Can you handle this? We're going to get married? No, I can't marry a man who doesn't trust me. Maybe in a couple of years we'll talk about this again. Ah, got it. You want to stay single in case another guy like Gary comes along. Bastard! One more remark like that and I'll hit you in the head. Now go and turn off your phones. I don't want to be interrupted. It only took about an hour to load her things into the car. Terry was right. She really got rid of almost everything. She sold the remaining furniture to the owner for $200. When I finished loading the car, she walked up to the bakery and said she was leaving. Soon after, we hit the highway, heading south. I looked at her and we both smiled. I have one more question, the last one. Okay, what's the matter? Where the hell did you get a Mel Gibson poster? Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one. 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 Listening.